and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must be. The title of my lesson is Talk the Talk. And when I first got this email, my thoughts went straight to keeping my word with people. But when I did some more studying, I came to the conclusion that this verse is encouraging us to keep our vows to God. Take people out of the picture and keep your vows to God. What does our vow look like? Well, a vow by definition is an action to solemnly promise to do a specific thing. To dedicate yourself to a particular task, to someone or something, especially a deity. From what I know about Korean martyrdom, most of you in this audience have made a vow to God. The Bible says in Romans 10 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes it is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And we know through studying the Bible that everyone who makes this confession completes the vow with that thing. So when did you make your vow? Write it down in your notes if you remember. For me, this vow was put in place seven years ago on April 7th. So God did his part. He sent Jesus to sacrifice his life for us. We did our part by obeying the gospel. But if we just obeyed the gospel and lived our life the same as before, our vow would be pointless. It would be broken immediately. So what are some things that we need to be dedicating our life to in order to keep our vow with God? Please turn with me to Acts 2, 42. It reads, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayers. These people dedicated themselves to a Christian life right away. They did not wait for anyone to remind them for the new year to come to make a resolution. They obeyed the gospel and they dedicated themselves right away. According to the scripture, we are called to not delay in dedicating ourselves to four things. Number one, don't delay in studying the Bible. Often we make this so much more complicated than it sounds. When as college students, we study every day at least five subjects. Some of you are crazy and you do more than that. And for 19 weeks at a time. Studying the Bible is not like studying your teacher's notes, your PowerPoints. It's not transmitting information. Studying the Bible is a conversation with God that strengthens our relationship with him. Ladies, you know, what's a conversation, what's a relationship without conversation? What's a relationship if you're the only one starting these conversations? <laughs> John 8.31 says, Jesus said to them, to the Jews who have believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is what motivates me to wake up every morning and to study my Bible. Studying the Bible and knowing the words of God are what separates us from other Christians. Some of us get caught up in how often should we read the Bible? Should I read it every day? Should I read it when I need it? Should I read it when I have time? God highlights a group of people in Acts 17 11 that study the Bible daily, and God highlights them for a reason. It says, now the Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were said. Once a very special friend told me, the more your Bible falls apart, the less you are. When you don't read the Bible ever, or even just in the mornings or during the day, that's like leaving the house without putting on your armor or putting on your body spray. Imagine that leaving the house without doing it. Some practical ways that you can be more consistent in reading the Bible include doing, doing a Bible study with a friend, together but separate, 
that way you're doing both have your quiet time, but you still have an accountability. Or I enjoy setting aside quiet time for Jesus and coffee. So you usually find me somewhere in the staff dorm with my Bible and Jesus. I mean coffee. <laughs> Two important things. <laughs> One friend who enjoys studying the Bible right before they go to bed, and another friend that enjoys reading it before she even gets out of her bed, because she says it's the things that you put into your mind first that kind of predict what the day's going to be like. So don't delay in studying the Bible. Number two, don't delay in prayer. About a year ago, at Bologna and Church of Christ, my youth group had this prayer retreat, and so. There was like 20 of us, we all got together, and we split up the guys and the girls, and we basically pulled them on there just to pray. And that night, I saw the great importance of crying out to a God who already knows your needs, your wants, and your desires, and He still wants to listen to you every moment. We are connected to God through prayer. Just like I mentioned before, what is a relationship if there's only one person talking all the time? God gets to talk to you through his word, and you get to talk to him through his word. James, 1, James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. A few ways that I like to communicate with God is by finding a quiet place and just praying on God. Connecting with him through prayer. Or you can connect through your thoughts and write a journal. That way you can look back on what prayers that you prayed and see if you want to be answered. Or pray with a friend. And of course, the best way to become more consistent in prayer is to pray with have a prayer buddy. Don't delay in prayer, ladies. Don't delay in fellowship. Number three, don't delay in fellowship. Fellowship is one of my most favorite aspects of Christian living. Being able to be surrounded by people who are like-minded with me is such a privilege and it's so helpful when you're trying to walk the walk and talk the talk. Don't give up on finding the right people to fellowship with because it makes such a big difference. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Fellowship reminds us that we're not doing this alone. You do not have to walk the walk and talk the talk by yourself, but you need to find people to fellowship with. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And I know we try to quiet this down a little bit and make it seem like it's it's not what it says, it's what it says it is. But it's true. And it's proven time after time that we're going to become most like those people that were surrounded with. Don't delay in fellowship. Don't delay in taking the Lord's supper. Number four, don't delay in taking the Lord's Supper. Most of our lives, we are constantly reminded to go to church. But what are we doing at church? It's not just going to church that we do on Sundays. The reason that we go is to fulfill our vow and dedicating ourselves to studying the Bible, to prayer, to fellowship, and to the Lord's Supper. Don't delay in taking the Lord's Supper. Because it is our opportunity to remember what Jesus did for us. What we do and why we do it. When you sit there and take the Lord's Supper, think about what Jesus did and all the things that you're now able to do because of his sacrifice. Without his sacrifice, we would have no hope, no savior, and no celebration. Luke 22, 19 through 20 says, And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then pour it out for you. And this cup is poured out for you, for you, <laughs> in the government of my life. 
This is important because this is Jesus' first time of recognizing his God to us. And so in that, we need to recognize his God and appreciate what he did. Don't delay in taking the Lord's Supper. Other than the score that I just mentioned, studying the Bible, prayer, fellowship, and taking the Lord's Supper, I believe that there's a fifth thing that we need to be dedicated to as Christians. Please turn to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And it reads, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am always with you to the end of the age. Number five, don't delay in evangelism. It's not just for the preachers, and it's not just for the elders to do, and it's not just for the men in general. This is a commanding requirement of all Christians. Four reasons why evangelism is important include, one, it builds your faith. Two, it strengthens what you know. Three, it brings others to the knowledge of Christ. And four, it grows the Lord's strength. Number one, evangelism builds your faith. In 2015, my family and I went to a week there campaign, and we utilized the door knocking method. There was so many people there, and the way that it worked was that we all stood out into many different groups and then we went out to evangelize. And as a family of five, we were all split up into many different groups, and we had very different experiences. Every evening we came back, there was this um, gospel meeting. And if you're not sure what a gospel meeting is, it's so very convicting. And there was one member of my family that had not yet obeyed the gospel. And between hearing those gospel meetings and going out every day and sharing the gospel that he did not yet obey, my younger brother obeyed the gospel that week. And evangelism built his faith. Evangelism can build your faith too. Number two, it strengthens what you know. My congregation has a series of studies that I personally enjoy doing just to refresh myself. I enjoy using them to introduce people to God and His Word. It's like the first steps. And so about four years ago, I was joining my father in campus ministry, and there was a group of us coming. And we, we found out how open young people are to just learning new things in college. And we found this couple that were interested in studying the Bible. And so we split up guys and girls, and I happened to be the only girl that knew how to read a Bible study. And so I was 15 years old, and I was scared to death teaching college students how to, how to get to know the Lord. But that experience, it just totally strengthened my faith. And it made me very clear of what I was not sure about, so that I could prepare better for next time. Most importantly, that young lady obeyed the gospel. And so evangelism can strengthen what you know. I know evangelism is hard. It's, it's a challenge. But you'll never get better at it, and it won't get easier if you don't start practicing now. Let God work through you and build your faith and strengthen what you know. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. Focus on
that they find in common with. Don't delay in evangelism because you can be somebody's chance to know. You can make a difference. Number four, evangelism builds the right church. Luke 10 and 2 says, I'm searching the harvest is plenty, but the labor is empty. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Let's say there's about 30 of you in here. And if each of you are fulfilling the God of God and you bear one other person in Christ, that's going to be another 30 people in the church. And just imagine you talk to them so well that they're fulfilling your God too, and they bring another 30 people to Christ. And that's three times as many people that are in this room that are not only in the church, but they're not going to hell either. All because you fulfilled your God. And it just goes on and on and on. You can make such a difference. Now again, I know evangelism is hard, but don't worry because I know you can do it. You can do all things. Isaiah 41 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Luke 1 37 says, For nothing is impossible with God. If you are devoted to studying your Bible, to prayer, to fellowship, and to the Lord's Supper, this is not even going to be hard for you because you're just so prepared. And please realize that God's not just commanding us to do something and then just posting us, He's not just leaving us out there to dry. He's going to be with us every part of the way, He's going to equip us with every good work through his word. I can say it for you, 16 through 17. So what are some practical ways to evangelize? Please think about it, because I love it so much if you message me with your idea of a practical way to evangelize. But some that I came up with is one, you can show Jesus. You can be kind and generous and open about your life. I've experienced time after time, usually after showing Jesus, that people just ask, they're like, how? Like, who are you? And I get to tell them that I read my Bible every morning. I hang out with people that encourage me to draw closer to God. And that just opens up a big door for conversation about Jesus. Number two, you can just show them that you care. If any of you have gone out to eat with me, any of my friends here, they know that if we're going to eat and they ask me to pray, I'm going to ask the waiter or waitress if they have any prayers. Because that opens an opportunity to show them that I care and to tell them more about God. Number three, be invitational. You can invite them to church, invite them to a church event. Or you, if it's a woman, you can just invite her to come study the Bible with you. And if it's a man, you can at least keep his interest a little bit and then introduce him to someone who can study the Bible with you. As women, we can be so persuasive with our words. Some of you call it charm, others call it influence, but whatever you call it, you have it. And you need to use it to glorify God. Bring somebody to Christ with your charm. So I ask you today, have you made it out of God? Have you been slow to fulfilling your God? Or have you just been waiting to make your God in the first place? I encourage you today, dedicate yourself to studying the Bible, to prayer, to the Lord's Supper, to fellowship, and to evangelism. Some of us have decided just this year of a resolution that we're going to start praying more. Well, don't delay any longer. At the end of it all, we want to say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, 7. God was so serious about you when he sent your holy son to die. And the most that he's asking you to do is to be serious about keeping your God. Don't delay in keeping your God. Thank you.